One of the great things about electric cars is if you're an automotive designer, you can pretty much draw what you want. As long as you stick within, obviously, the, the rules of the land, the legislation that's there, because you don't have a big engine to package or a transmission to package. And I'm talking about pure electric cars that are designed like that from day one, not converted piston engine ones. Take the BMW i3, for instance. That was unlike anything BMW had ever done before. It didn't look like anything else in its range. And even its controversial iX, as gopping as it is to look at, you're not going to confuse that with an X5. Hyundai is another great example. Look at the Ionic 5 and the Ionic 6, two of their newest electric cars. They don't look anything like each other or anything else like the Hyundai range. Even Audi, the king of the Russian doll styling, its e-tron GT is, bite the back of your hand, gorgeous and looks nothing else like Audi currently do. So imagine my surprise when Mercedes-Benz launched this, the new EQE, which is, to all intents and purposes, pretty much identical to the EQS. Welcome to this week's Road Test Review. Welcome to the new Mercedes-Benz EQE, I think. Oh yeah, EQE. And of course, as always, welcome to Auto EV. Now, before we get cracked on with this week's road test review of the new Mercedes-Benz EQE, it is, of course, that time where I ask you to make sure that you are subscribed to the Auto EV channel. Once you've done that, make sure you press the little bell button that's down below, because then that way you'll be notified of when our next video is uploaded and goes live. Once you've watched the video, if you do like it, make sure you give it a thumbs up and leave us your comments down below as well. Let us know your thoughts on the cars that review, such as the new EQE, and obviously on the channel as a whole. So what do we have for you this week? Well, as I say, it's the new Mercedes-Benz EQE, which looks pretty much identical to their EQS. You see, it's their entry into sort of like that kind of large executive saloon sector. So in other words, like the EQS that sits alongside the kind of luxurious S-Class, this sits alongside the normal E-Class and CLS ranges in Mercedes-Benz range. And like the EQS, it sits on a bespoke EV platform. It actually shares the same platform as the EQS as well. So it's a bespoke EV platform. It doesn't have any of the compromises that come from, say, converting a piston engine car like an E-Class into an electric one. But as I say, they've gone down the route of aerodynamic efficiency to help with range, which means that it pretty much looks identical to the EQS. Now, don't think this is a one-off because they've now brought out SUV variants of these cars, imaginatively titled the EQS SUV and the EQE SUV, which, like the saloon cars, look absolutely identical to each other. But before we go on with the review, let's take a quick snapshot of what the EQE is all about. Well, first of all, it's pretty much Mercedes-Benz's bread and butter car in the fact that it's a large executive saloon, just like countless generations of the E-Class before it. Like I say, it sits on a dedicated EV architecture shared with the slightly longer EQS Luxury Saloon. It has a 90 kilowatt hour battery, which according to WLTP figures should give a range of up to 388 miles, depending on the model. And it's priced from around £75,000 all the way to £115,000 for the range topping EQE AMG 53. Which means when all is said and done, this is not an inexpensive car. And given our love of the SUV at this price point, does this make the EQE worthy of your consideration? Or is it really just a tick in the box exercise for Mercedes-Benz to appease its more kind of traditional saloon shaped buyers? Well, of course, the only way we're gonna find out is by putting it through the road test that those buyers actually trust when it comes to choosing their next electric vehicle. And of course, well, it's the Auto EV one, isn't it? So let's start with the styling of the car. And yeah, again, like the EQS, as much as I admire it, it's probably the least successful aspect of the car. Now, I get Mercedes-Benz's reason for doing this. It's going for aerodynamic efficiency, and it's been very successful at that, which does obviously help when it comes to the range of the car. But even so, it is a little bit bland in my eyes. And you know, it's not too difficult to make an aerodynamic car look like a great looking car. I'm looking at you, Vauxhall Calibra from the 1980s. Anyway, let's have a little look and see what we've got. How do you tell it apart from an EQS? Well, there are differences. You can tell them apart. The headlight 
um, signature is different as well and this sort of like area here is slightly different and of course you don't get the light bar that runs across um, the top of sort of like the, the sorry the top of this area of grill here at the bottom of the bonnet to join the two headlights the EQS has that the EQE doesn't now on the standard EQEs, not the AMG Fettled models, there are four trim levels which we'll talk about later in pricing. The top two, of which this is the top of the range one, gets these little three-pointed stars embedded in what would be sort of like that grill area. But without them, that's going to be really bland because it's just going to be black plastic across the front of the car. And it's going to look really, really bland, I think. Of course, you get a big three-pointed star in the middle with the embedded camera down in there. And of course your Mercedes-Benz badge there. No upright three-pointed star on these. You don't get the... Which I think would have been quite nice actually maybe to have and given it a bit of a visual lift at the front maybe. Um, again, trim level wise, this is the exclusive luxury and you get these digital light headlights. And they have, believe it or not, a million pixels per headlamp. And they are absolutely phenomenal at night. I drove the car in the dark the other night and they are just giving uh, they're just automatically themselves depending on traffic conditions road conditions uh, weather conditions and of course ambient light and they are phenomenal so that is one thing i will say about those headlamps they are superb uh, down the bottom well you've got a bit of fakery going on here looks like a vent but it's not and then of course all your cooling is down at the bottom there a little flash of chrome down the bottom here because the exclusive luxury gets a thing called um exterior art or something like that, which means it gets extra painted bits. No idea. Um, you get this clamshell bonnet, like you do in the EQS, to minimise shut lines, so it comes right to the wheel arches on this side here, but again, like the EQS, it doesn't open. There's no storage underneath here, and it's obviously full of electronic gubbins and whatever, but you, there's no storage here, which, again, for a bespoke EV platform, just seems like a little bit of a waste to me. So moving around the side is where you see this one bow. Uh, design uh, theme that Mercedes have got going on with this roof line that goes all the way up and swoops right back to this kind of truncated rear end here and it's the same how the glass house follows that as well and then of course you've got a shut line down into the wheel arch as well this is the bit as well I'm not 100% convinced of there's a lot of different panes going on here this looks quite fussy this glass house you know between windows and pillars and little quarter light infills and that it just looks all a little bit fussy for me it's frameless doors which is quite nice i do like that but it just quite a kind of fussy profile on that glass house i think anyway a uh, big standout door mirrors as you can see here and this little flap here is for um filling up your washer bottle uh, fluid in there because obviously you can't get into there so it's in there yeah odd the charging flap is like a petrol flap it's on the other side of the car at the rear three quarters now depending on the trim level depend on the size of wheels you get now they start at 19s on the, the standard uh, the base lead in amg line car and um, this is a 21 inch wheels that you get on the exclusive luxury car which i have to say do fill the arches up i think the mercedes have got this thing because they've gone again for this aero efficiency type of thing some of the alloys are quite bland on the lower model cars and i think you probably do want some of the bigger wheels um to just to give it a bit more of a kind of visual lift and that's going to be a bit of an issue when it comes to choosing your trim specs, as we'll talk about later. Anyway, moving further down the side, you've got your uh, door handles that pop out when you actually sort of like lock or unlock the car. Uh, when you want to get them out, they pop out. As you can see, when you lock it, your powerful mirrors can slide away. You get a bit of chrome flash down at the bottom there. But that's really it. There's not really a massive amount of difference. I mean, it's literally the same German sausage, different length to the EQS, which means it is, data suggest, pretty much just as dull to look at as that one is. Now, of course, around the back, well, again, as I said, same Bratwurst, different length. It is pretty much identical to an EQS, except for one part, because the EQS is a big tailgate that lifts up, whereas the EQ is actually a booted saloon, believe it or not, which will obviously show in the practicality section. So you do get this slightly um, sort of like protruding section here at the bottom of the screen where you've got your high level brake light in it. Uh, and obviously you've got an integrated rear spoiler here, your big Mercedes-Benz badge, which obviously doubles up as the, the boot release, and Derriger light bar across the back 
it's kind of like the design department were told by the management to come up with a sort of like an electric E-class size saloon car and they just thought to themselves, do you know what, there's a beer festival on. Grab that drawing of an EQS, stick it in the photocopier at 80% and hand it to the management and let's go down the pub. The thing is, if they do continue along this line and there's an EQC saloon coming out, they may just do the same again. In which case, Polestar and BMW will have a real winner on their hands in some respects. Even Tesla's design department seems a bit more adventurous than this. Hmm. But what do you think? Am I being too harsh on this? Is there a, an element of this that I'm just not getting? I mean, does it speak executive luxury saloon motoring to you and its design? And have I got it completely wrong? Well, as always, let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. All right, maybe I'm being a little bit harsh when it comes to styling. Let's see if it wins on other areas. Well, practicality's not bad. 430 litres of boot space is what you get. Now, you see what I mean here? Of course, the EQS has that big opening hatch, whereas this is just a normal, conventional, booted saloon um, style of car. And 430 litres was OK. It's actually not too bad. I think my entire family is on holiday without telling me because they seem to have borrowed all of the Auto EV suitcases. I've only got two of them left, but four of them will actually fit in here. There isn't really a problem at all. And you'd also be able to get sort of two bags of golf sticks or whatever they're called in there as well, which probably is going to be quite important maybe for the buyers of this car. Um, the boot opening itself is your kind of limitation in terms of getting sort of like bigger, bulkier items in, obviously, like any saloon car will be. But the rear seats do fold down as well, and that'll open up to about 890 litres, given all told. But you're not going to be getting big, because I say bulk items in, but at least you can take slightly longer loads in. The boot floor itself is not bad. It's a reasonable sort of shape. The only thing I will say is that it's slightly disappointing. There's not really a huge amount of cable storage, which means you actually get this separate bag for your cables so that's there so that kind of is there there is a little bit of storage in here oops but it's taken up by things like the first aid kit and the tire pressure um, inflation system and the lock and wheel nut key so it's not ideal and again for a bespoke kv i'm a little surprised at that so rear accommodation well as much as i say it's shorter than an EQS. It is still a long car. It's almost five metres long and it does have a hugely long wheelbase because they've pushed the wheels right out to the extremities of the car to increase interior space. And it has what? Because actually, you've just got bags of space back here. I mean, look at it. That seat's set up for myself. And as you all know, I'm five foot seven or five foot eight, one of the two. And I've just got bags of legroom behind myself. Even if there was a six foot driver uh, driving it, pushing the seat back a little bit, I'd still have acres of space here. Where it is a little bit tight, funnily enough, is starting to be headroom because of that design, funnily enough. This car's got, well, in fact, all EQEs have this beautifully big uh, glass panoramic uh, sunroof, which does open. The front section actually opens like a conventional sunroof. And you've got a blind that can come across if you want to kind of shade yourself away. But it does mean that if I was six foot, I'd be struggling for headroom back here. So just watch yourself on that. Um, the feeling is slightly different to the EQS back here. That was very kind of soft and kind of luxurious and like an S-Class. You know, you've got the padded kind of head restraints and, you know, you felt really cosseted back here. And I'm not saying you don't in the EQE, you do. But it will depend on the model as to whether you get this leather or not. And I think that really does make a bit of a difference, if I'm honest with you. Um, you've got some nice little touches, in fairness. You've got the kind of nice ambient lighting round about these kind of, uh, sort of like protruding uh, panels on the door. This particular model's got heated rear seats, but again, it's dependent on the spec you get. You've got the air style, air, uh, sorry, aircraft style, um, rigid mat pockets in the backs of the seats. Uh, climate control in the back, again, depending on model. Um, Isofix points, nice and easy to get to. They're hidden behind these plastic covers. They are great to get into. And you've got reasonable sort of storage because obviously you've got your armrest that folds out. Oh, hang on. He says to give you, hey, hey, cup holders. Fantastic. And the door bins are of, a, they're not particularly deep but they do sort of run the width of the door, so you could probably put a book or an iPad in there 
if you weren't going in there. Um, there's connectivity. You flip down, a, sorry, you fold down this little flap here and you've got USB-C ports in there. So yes, yeah, space-wise, it's good as long as you're not thinking a headroom and storage is okay and comfort is excellent. Now, thankfully, up here, things improve greatly because at the moment, I feel like I'm being really hard on the EQE. And I don't mean to be in some respects, but as I say, the driving environment is where things start to really improve. However, there is a caveat with that because it will depend on the trim level that you go for. Now, effectively, there are four trim levels. If you discount the, the actual AMG car, the Mercedes AMG cars, which is the EQE 53s, there are four trims. There's AMG line, AMG line premium, AMG line premium plus, and then this, which is the exclusive luxury, which is, believe it or not, the only one of them that actually gets a leather interior, a standard. And actually, you can option it on the others. Instead, on the AMG line cars, you get sort of like a leatherette, or vinyl as we used to call it, and then this kind of microfiber suede um, inlays on the centre of the seats, and the slightly different seats, the more sports seats, whereas this one has comfort seats, which I have to admit are superb. Um, you also don't get this kind of yacht deck like uh, fascia veneer on any of the others. It's only on the exclusive luxury. Instead, you get like a kind of black kind of wood veneer. Now, my wife doesn't particularly like this. She was in the car and she says, I don't really like that. I do. I think this is a really lovely interior and I actually like it. And that's probably kind of the spec that I would really like. But what I find really, really odd with them is there are certain bits of equipment you can't get on some of the lower down cars. So for instance, if you thought, well actually I'm a little bit younger than you, Brian, what I want is an AMG line car, but I want it with a heated steering wheel. You can't have it. You can't option a heated steering wheel on some of the lower trim cars. You've got to go for an exclusive luxury or the AMG line premium plus car before you get a heated steering wheel. That's a bit rubbish, I think, if I'm being honest with you. Same for ventilated seats. You've got to get the exclusive luxury trim before you get ventilated seats. Head up display top two trim levels only you can't even option a head-up display on the basic car which is you know over, still over seventy thousand pounds come on mercedes that's a bit rubbish isn't it anyway there you go um you will notice the other difference in here to the eqs that we um road tested last uh, year no hyper screen and that's because you can't get it on an eqe unless you go for one of the AMG cars, the, the, the uh, EQE AMG 53, um, and then it's an option. So I do find that a little bit strange, especially now that Mercedes have shown the interior of the new E-Class, which is about to come out, which has, to all intents and purposes, a hyperscreen. So the more technologically advanced all-electric version of the E-Class can't have it. Hmm. However, I don't think you need it. If I'm being honest with you, I like this. I think this has got to be one of the best interiors, not just from a visual aspect, from a usability aspect. I think this works really well. It's not perfect. It's not perfect. Um, but there's only one glaring flaw with it in far as I'm concerned that I've found when I've been driving it. And I'll start with that flaw. It's this. The driving position is excellent. That's first and foremost. To say these are the comfort seats and I like these and I've got a really good driving position. There's beautiful a range of adjustment. You can adjust the length of the squab, the backrest, um, obviously lumbar. It's got ventilated seats. It's got um, uh, heated seats as well. So that is fine. The steering wheel as well, I like this steering wheel. On the AMG line cars, it's got like a, uh, a twin spoke on the, the column, uh, sorry, on the, the, the these spokes here, um, which is all right, but I quite like this one. This is nice. It's a nice girth. It's a nice size. It's not the, sort of like the oversized steering wheels that used to be prevalent Mercedes-Benz way back in the, the 80s and 90s. I had a Mercedes 190E 2.5 16 valve, which had this huge big steering wheel. Um, but this is a normal size wheel and it's nice to hold. I like it. The problem is this. When I get it in the perfect driving position, like the little Hyundai Ionic 5, it cuts off this section of this display, the instrumentation panel. Now, normally you can have this um, with dials up, which would mean that it cuts off an area of the speedo and the, 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 um, sort of like the economy meter, if you like, of that, where I'd want to see it. Thankfully, you can configure this how you want it. So you get it like I've got at the moment, where you've got your navigation in the centre and I've got the speed 
bang center in the, there. So you can change it, so all is not lost, but it is a little bit annoying that when I get to the exact position I want at the steering wheel, that the instrument binnacle is obscured. If that had just been set down another half inch, it wouldn't be a matter, it wouldn't be a problem. But it is, so depending how you set this screen up, you're gonna miss out parts of the actual display. So that's it. While I'm on that, let me just talk about that. So you can actually, let's see if I can do it. You can set it up. Um, you can have various different things here. So here. So this one here I had, which was the classic display. There you go, speedo on left. I can't read anything from 20 miles an hour to 100 miles an hour. Can't read it, it's, it's obscured. So you've got to have it with the speed in the center there. Anyway, you can change it how you want it. As I say, oh, sorry, hang on. No, I don't want to do that. I want to return from that. I want to do this. Uh, you can have a sports dials, which, as I say, gives it with the centre speedometer there, which is quite handy. Uh, what else can you have? Understated, which is quite nice, but again, it obscures the speedometer here, and you've got a clock on that side, which you can't read. <laughs> um, and then, obviously, you can have it as the map where I had it, or you can have your assistance up. So there is a huge amount you can actually do to um, alleviate that issue. So, as I say, all is not lost. It's very clear, it's very crisp, you get all the information you want, you've got your range um, down the bottom there. It tells you your range, um, miles left to empty, but it will also tell you what its maximum it thinks it can do as well if you change a few settings and go into the eco mode. So at the moment I'm showing that I've got 112 miles left in the tank, but it's saying I could go as far as 147 miles if I change maybe my driving style, which is quite nice to do. And this side here, you've got various different things like outside temperature and your transmission. Um, the, the transmission lever itself is the traditional Mercedes mounted column stock, which is up here, which works really well and I really like it and it's nice and easy to use. Um, the steering wheel, while we're on that, it does have touch sensitive buttons. So, you know, for volume on that side and for cruise control on that side, it is a touch sensitive button, but the big difference with the Mercedes system over the Volkswagen system is it works. It is literally just a glance of your finger will turn the radio up or turn it down as you see fit. It's really slick. I love the way that Mercedes interacts with you as a driver. And also the buttons are mounted just that slightly further in on the steering wheel so you don't tend to hit them with the heel of your hand, which is what you do with the Volkswagen Group cars. We jump across now to the infotainment screen, which is this 12.8 inch screen. As you can see, it's mounted in a, um, a portrait um, style. Also, I don't know if you can pick up that noise. The car makes some really, really weird noises when you open and close it, when you're sitting in it. It just make, continues to make the odd little noise or two. Really odd. Anyway, um, what was I talking about? Yes, this screen here, the Mercedes-Benz um, MBUX, as they call it, the user interface, Slick as you like, absolutely fantastic to use. Home screen, everything's touch um, on the screen, even the climate system. However, like the Ford Mustang mach -E, it's always on. So although it is on the screen, it's always in the same place, so you know exactly where it is. So turning your temperature up and down is really nice and easy, and you get those lovely little clicks when you do it as well. So it's very, very simple to use. Um, climate menu you can bring up as well if you do want to change the directional flow so you can have more in-depth menu if you want that or you can just flick everything to automatic um, like I do and that's that um, what else have you got well you've got your navigation which is really responsive really easy to use you can have it up in two dimension or three dimension as you have here you've also got wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto as you'd expect um, so if you're using Apple Maps or Google Maps, that is as slick as you like as well. Um, what else have we got? We'll go back to here, home. Um, you've got your radio system, which obviously comes up here. Well, it's a huge and as I say, for Aboriginal spheres, which were taken by the explorer James Nice and easy on your volume there. Absolutely simple to do. Really simple. Um, and then you just scroll through to what you want. Settings of your car. And there's so much you can set up. Um, which is really good. My daughter spent like an evening the other night playing with the ambient lights in here. There's so many different settings for the ambient lights. And then once you get it all, all set up, it's, it's phenomenal. It's really, really cool in here. I like it. Um, the other thing as well you can do is obviously you've got different apps. Mercedes Me, um, which is the Mercedes like Benz app store and things like that. And it will also do voice 
um, activation as well. Um, and having used this, one thing I do think Mercedes are really slick on is that voice command system because what it will do is it will sort of learn your accent, which is handy for a silly wee Scotsman like me that nobody understands. So it sort of understands that there is an accent in the car. The other clever thing it will do, for instance, is it will know where the voice is coming from. So, for instance, let's say you had a passenger who wanted to turn on their heated seat. They don't actually have to use um, the screen itself. They can just say, hey, mm -hmm, turn on heated seat. And it will know that it's the passenger that's saying that and turn on the passenger seat. Really clever, really slick. I really like it. Very good. The only other bugbear, as I say, that I have is with the options. Um, as I say, not being able to have certain options. So, for instance, 360 degree parking camera. Now, that is becoming something that's available on cars way less money than this Mercedes Benz. But again, you can't have it unless you go for the top spec car. You can't option it on the lower spec EQAs. So it's not even a tick in the box. You could just add on. You'd say, well, I want that trim, but I want to have that option. You can't. That's it. You've got to move up in trim levels, which I think is a real shame in some respects. The quality, however, is very good. The only blight on that are these air vents on the side, these turbine-like air vents. I love the style of them. I really love the look of them. But as soon as you touch them, you just go, oh, they're really cheap and plasticky. Don't like them at all. If they were metal, I don't understand why they haven't put them as metal, because that would be really, that's all that needs if that was just metal, because then that would just change um, the only one flaw I can find in terms of the quality. Um, storage, storage is good. You've got your two kind of cup holders in the centre bit here, which obviously also houses your wireless charging pad in there, and you can cover that up if you want. And there's a nice little kind of um, storage tray in there as well. You've got a little pop-up um, thing in there as well, where you've got connectivity if you really want to connect your phone rather than wirelessly connect it. That goes in there. There's some good storage underneath the console as well. So like the EQS, as I say, you've got this um, big kind of flat storage here because there's no transmission needed. So that's nice and easy to see. Um, and there is also, if I can find the button for it, a glove box, which is nice and big as well. So plenty of storage. Same with the door bins. They're rubber lined in the front. Don't know why they're not in the back. That would make a bit of a note difference. Um, but they're rubber lined so your sunglasses and things don't rattle around in them. The panoramic roof, which I like, as I say, it's just a swipe, and then that closes the blind, both front and back. Really slick, really clever. Um, and the same just to open it again. That's what I mean, it's touch sensitive, but it works. Volkswagen, just get Mercedes to do your plumbing controls. And again, if you want to open the actual sunroof, you just swipe it back again, and it opens the sunroof. I mean, that's it. Simple as that. In fact, you don't even have to do that. Hey, Mercedes. I'm sorry. Oh. Can you say... Hey, Mercedes. I'm sorry, but I can't help you with that right now. That's one for the bloopers, isn't it? Anyway, it will do it. If you ask the car to do it, it will open or close the sunroof. Trust me. Um, last but not least... There is the little buttons that are along the bottom here. So you've got your dynamics uh, button here for changing your driving modes. Um, and what you can do is you can set it up so you've got economy, comfort, sport and individual. And I'll talk about these when we drive it, but the individual mode means you can tailor the car how you want it. So if you want uh, sportier steering but softer suspension, you know, you can pick and choose how you want it. And that's your individual choice in there. Um, as I say, your parking camera, this 360 degree camera, um, which is very clever, but say, as long as you're willing to spend the money on the actual top of the range car. Um, the EQ button, well, that gives you all your um, sort of like economy settings uh, where you can set things up, obviously, in terms of if you want to set it to charge at a particular time or switch on, you know, in the morning if you're ready to leave for work or whatever, you can program that all in. Um, car settings so you can adjust your head up display as well as being able to adjust the sorry configure that you can also configure what you see in the head up display which i really like too um what else you've got hazard warning fingerprint recognition 
Again, something that's quite clever. It was on the Genesis uh, Electrified GV70 SUV we tested a couple of weeks ago. It's on the Mercedes-Benz, and again, it will just store all of your settings. So when you get in, you put your fingerprint on it, and it knows who's driving the car, and it sets your seats up and your radio stations up and does all that. Very clever. And then, obviously, you're on and off button, and then you're just your volume control there. It's brilliant, and I genuinely don't miss not ha sorry having that hyper screen that we had in EQS. As impressive as that was, I genuinely don't think you're going to miss out having that here. And I'd say the only flaw I can really put towards this setup is just that the way the wheel cuts out that uh, binnacle. That's it. Otherwise, I think the only issue is the fact that those options and that trim level, you've got to just be careful. Depending on what you want, you may have to spend more money. Um, to get a particular option, which I do think is a really odd thing for Mercedes-Benz to do. But other than that, in terms of its overall setup, I love the interior of this car. I think it is a wonderful place to spend time in and very comfortable. Now, the EQE uses quite a big battery. It has a usable capacity of 89 kilowatt hours. Now, we're just talking today about the EQE models, not the EQE AMG models, okay? Because their battery is slightly different. So it's just the EQE 300 or the EQE 350 that we're really concentrating on. Now, according to WLTP figures, that should give you a range of between 346 miles and 389 miles, depending on model. If you look at something like the EV database, um, which we're very grateful to uh, being out there because we're starting to use the, their data as well, they're suggesting it's probably going to be as low as 230 in really cold, cold weather with big sort of like motorway driving up to sort of like a maximum of around about the sort of like 320 miles and sort of like more milder weather with sort of like, you know, a more combined driving style, which in fairness is what I've been experiencing with the car in my time with it um, over the last few days, because it's quite mild, although a little bit chillier today. So I'm gonna say I've yet to see less than a good 300 mile range out of the car, which is really very good. But of course it is a big old battery that's in it. Now, where it slightly disappoints, however, is in the, sort of like the EV architecture, in terms of there's no um, 800 volt architecture here like you get on from Hyundai or even Porsche now, um, and you don't get things like vehicle to load or vehicle to grid uh, charging with the EQE, nor do you with the EQS in fairness, which I think is a real disappointment, Can again, considering it is a bespoke ground up EV from a company like Mercedes-Benz. The other thing is the charging speeds. It will only take charging speeds up to 170 kilowatts, which again is okay and sort of on a par with a lot of cars out there, but it's not brilliant when you think of what Tesla's been doing all this time and again what you think of what Hyundai, Kia and Porsche can now do. So that is a little bit disappointing, especially with the tie-in with people like Ionity that Mercedes do have. Now talking of charging then, you can go from your usual 10 to 80% benchmark in the usual 30 minutes as you'd expect. And whilst the car does have an onboard 11 kilowatt charger, most people are more likely to have the more usual 7 kilowatt home wall box. And if you're using one of those to go from flat to full with a battery of this size, then you're probably going to be looking at around about 14 hours. Now, like I said, you can have an EQE that's been AMG fettled, but we're, we're not going to discuss them in this video. So effectively, with the standard range, you're looking at two power outputs. You're looking at either the standard EQE 300, which is 245 brake horsepower, or this one, which is the EQE 350, which is 292 brake horsepower. And this will scamper its way to 60 miles an hour in 6.4 seconds. The lower powered car takes an additional 0.9 seconds to do it in 7.3. So it's not blisteringly fast, but as I say, that's what the AMGs are there for. But if you're coming maybe from, say, a Tesla Model S, you might be disappointed with that. Um, but maybe something from like an E-Class hybrid, it's on a par. So it's okay. I don't think it needs to be any faster in terms of where the car's kind of USP is. Um, going back to this whole trim level thing as well, because this is important. If you go for... Um, this car, which is the exclusive luxury, then you are riding on, uh, you also get it on the MG Line Premium Plus. It's very confusing. Um, you also get the airmatic suspension, and that's the adaptive dampers um, with the air suspension that you get on the EQS as well. 
The other thing you get is rear wheel steer, where the rear wheels will steer up to four and a half degrees, just to aid with um, kind of handling and obviously low speed maneuverability. You don't get it on the lower two cars, and they're on standard coil springs. I quite like to try a car on the standard coil springs, just to see what the ride quality is like. On this car, it's um, it's okay. It's not as wafty as an EQS. Um, you can, you, it's good, so, I mean, there's some little bumps there I've just gone over, and what you can do is, you can hear them, but you don't so much feel them, it's only the really sharper potholes and ridges um, where you really feel it through the cabin, and even then, you wouldn't call it uncomfortable, it's just, you're aware of them, that's what I would say, so it's certainly not an uncomfortable car. I think it's a very refined car. I think wind noise is fairly well suppressed. Um, you've got double glazed doors. Sorry, that's my sunglasses case. Let me just move that. Um, you've got double glazed side windows as well, so it keeps a lot of the sort of like the outside noisy and extraneous noises from the uh, from the outside weather out of the cabin, which is good. Tiny little bit of wind rustle, maybe around about these bigger door mirrors, but not enough to make you think actually. There's something, you know, there's, there's wind getting into the car. Handling-wise, it's okay. It's a heavy car, this, as most EVs are. It's 2.4 tonnes. Now, when you leave it in the standard comfort mode, you can feel the body roll. You can feel it. Not, it doesn't lurch, but you can just feel it as you go into a bend and you just apply some lock. You can feel it just heave to the side a little bit. It doesn't stay resolutely flat. Now, obviously, as I said, there are different driving modes, and you can play around with them. There's a button down here called Dynamic, and if I move into there's the, your usual Eco mode that just dulls everything off and just, you know, makes everything kind of maxes up your range and all that kind of thing, so it shuts the climate down a little bit and really dulls the throttle response quite a bit. And then you, from there, you go into Comfort, which is your standard mode, which is pretty much what I've been driving it in. But then you can go into sport. Oh, and you make a funny noise. And if you can listen, I don't know if you can hear it. You get one of those digital noises. It's not an engine noise. It's like the Taycans. It's got that kind of digital, sort of like, um, almost like a kind of orchestral kind of uh, chord being played as you accelerate when you're in the sport mode. I quite like it. I have to admit, it's quite nice. It's quite fun. It makes the car a little bit more dynamic. Um, there's a bit of a sharper response in the throttle. It's not like standing on a landmine, um, you know, whereas you get some cars when you go from comfort to sport, the throttle response is so sharp, it's like, whoa, it just explodes underneath you. It's not that. You do still have that nice linear push on the throttle pedal, but it's just the response that comes from it is a little bit quicker. It's not night and day, but you do feel the difference, and I can understand why you would have it and why you might want to use it. I have to admit, I've had it on two or three times, um, just to have a play around with. I quite like it, it's quite fun. Um, let's talk about the brakes for a second, however. Let me just come out of that so I can shut the noise down, go back to comfort mode, there we go. Let me talk about the brakes for a second. There's brake regeneration, which you adjust via two paddles behind the steering wheel. I like that, I like the fact that the adjustability is there and it's nice and easy to use. Now, effectively, what you have is three um, standard settings. So it's either none at all, no, recu no recuperation, left-hand paddle, which by, oddly has a minus symbol on it, which gives you normal recuperation, and then one more click gives you strong recuperation, where you've got fairly close to one pedal driving in some respects. It's not is it's not as aggressive as say like the Nissan um, e-pedal used to be but it's quite nice I can see the use of it certainly round about town um, it's good enough for that the other mode however is there's an adaptive mode and that if memory serves me correctly you get by pulling on the right hand paddle and it's called intelligent recuperation this is quite clever because obviously and there are a few cars that have it in fairness but obviously what it's now doing is it will vary 
the um, regen braking depending obviously on what the car sees so for instance the car that's away ahead in front of me if it all of a sudden came to a stop and I wasn't paying attention the car would brake for me even without the, uh, the cruise control on so it's watching that car in front of me and it knows um, the distance between that and it would apply the brakes depending obviously on the car in front if you've got if you're using the sat nav as well it would use geographical location so it knows you're coming up to a roundabout so again it may apply so like a stronger kind of regen see i'm coming up to a set of traffic lights here and i'm not going to brake but the car in front of me is and it's stopping it's stopping it's stopping it's stopping it's stopping so really clever and it brings the car up to a complete halt that's good i like that that's very clever you can adjust the strength of the regen within that intelligent um recuperation but even so i'm quite happy with the way that works i think that's good uh right however there's a bit of a caveat to the brakes and that is when you're not using the regen the pedal likes far too much of a push to get the car to stop as i say this is a heavy car two and a half tons and for my liking, it just needs too much of an effort to slow the car down. You know, when you come off the pedal, off the accelerator, and you go onto the brakes, it's not the same kind of waiting. It needs a really firm push to get the car to slow up. And when you first drive it, certainly at higher speed, that really takes you by surprise. And I think that should be better. I think the brake feel should be much, much better than it is. Uh, steering feels nice, the steering's good. The, th the other mode that you get in the driving modes is an intelligent mode um, where you can pick and choose uh, what you want. So in other words, if you want uh, sort of like the sport, the sportier throttle response uh, with the kind of comfort setting on the suspension, uh, with the sport steering feel, you can set all that up to do that. Um, that's good, I like that. Um, so again, depending obviously on what your uh, likes and wants are, you can set the car up exactly how you want it to. And that's good, so you can go into the individual mode. So I like that. The driving position, as I said, is excellent. Bar that cut off of the, the, the instrument binnacle. That's the only thing that spoils uh, the driving position, if you like, is just, as I say, not being able to see um, the top kind of three, uh, two thirds of that screen uh, where the wheel goes. It's a bit of a downside. The other thing I will say in terms of visibility is these pillars are quite thick and it's quite steeply raked, obviously because of the design of the car. And that is one thing that I find quite, I don't know, it's just, there's a bit of a blind spot there. Um, I can see why there's a little kind of window in that quarter light because otherwise you'd have a really thick pillar there. Um, which can take you by surprise. Um, so you do have to kind of be aware of that. The other thing on visibility is that rear window is a letterbox. In fact, actually I've seen bigger letterboxes. An Amazon delivery driver would have struggled to get something through that. Um, so you are kind of limited with rear visibility quite a bit, I would say. That's a real, again, down to the design of the car. When you can draw an EV exactly how you want it, you're not constrained by really anything other than the law, why would you make it as impractical in some respects as that? That's a really downside for me. In fact, you can't see above the rear head restraints. They literally hit, you know, you can only see the roof. So it's that centre section is all you can see. Not so good. Um, driver aids, these are worth a mention. Because again, depending on the model you go for will depend on the type and the level of driver aids that you have. Now, the exclusive luxury gets everything. So 360 degree parking camera, as I said, um, blind spot monitoring, active lane assist. Um, there's, some, there's another thing as well it does as well, active collision assist. You know, it's all sorts of assists that you get with it. However, what I like about it is this it's not intrusive. You get some cars with these driving assistance things and it's like a big burly bouncer in a nightclub. When you do something wrong, they just kind of manhandle you out the door and that's what the driver assistants do. It's like really aggressive and oh gosh, you know, it's like stop, stop, stop. The Mercedes is like your mate, just giving you that little gentle tug on your sleeve going, come on, 
come on, I think we've had a little bit too much to drink, let's get in a taxi and let's get you home. That's how it feels with the Mercedes, it's just that gentle reminder. There's not an aggressive sort of, oh my God, you're doing something wrong, stop this and I'm going to completely under control, which can sometimes be quite startling in a car. The Mercedes doesn't do that, it's very unobtrusive. It's there, and it's there in the background, and it doesn't make itself, it doesn't overwhelm you when it needs to come in. And I like that, I really like that. The lane keep assist, it's just that gentle kind of tug on the wheel, there's not this big massive movement of the wheel or a big vibration, it just gives you that little tug that says, come on, come on, pay attention, that's where you should be, lovely. Very good, very good. And that brings me back to where the EQE, I think, fits in with all of this. Because I struggled at first to really understand the car because I thought, well, it's not the kind of wafty luxury of the EQS and it's not as dynamic as something like a Taycan or an e-tron GT. And I just kind of couldn't quite figure out where the EQE's position was. And the more I drove it, the more I understand it. It is for people that do drive themselves, that don't get driven, that like a little bit of luxury, like a little bit of cosseting, don't want too much in the dynamics, they don't want to, have to think about it too much, but they just don't want the effort there. And that's where the Mercedes EQE wins for me. It's just, it's difficult to describe. There's a an effortlessness to it, there's a, a, not a serenity, because as I say, it's not like the EQS where you, you just don't feel any of the bumps at all and the whole thing. The EQS is like, you know, sort of like being cupped in the hand of a fair maid and it just kind of wafts you along. The EQE is not that, but nor is it this hard-edged kind of GT style of car like a Taycan or an e-tron. GT is. Now I'm not saying that the AMG ones won't be like that, I haven't driven them so I don't know, but what I am saying is it's just got that little bit more interaction with you as a driver without testing you too much, without making itself known too much. It takes a lot of the effort away from you while still allowing you to be in control of it. Maybe not explaining that really well but it is one of those cars that if you are looking at it five minutes behind the wheel going up and down the road will not sell you this car you've got to get in it you've got to spend time with it you've got to use it and when you do and when it all starts to kind of just come together all the good little bits about it all kind of come into one and you realize this is a good car. This is a really good car. It's almost hidden at first how good this is. It takes a bit of time and you've got to give it time. But it's there. It is there. So how much is all this going to cost you? Well, the range starts with the EQE 300 AMG line at just over £74,000. And we'll go all the way up to £115,000 if you want one that's been fettled by the AMG department. But as I say, they're another car for another day. We're just concentrating on the EQE 300 and the EQE 350, like we've got here. So effectively, this car here I have, which is an EQE 350 exclusive luxury, is the top of that particular range. Now that comes in on the road at just over £88,435. But with this car having metallic paint, that takes the price to over £89,000. So it's not an inexpensive car. And therein lies a little bit of my issue with it, because I think in some respects, some of the cars lower down the range would be maybe better pick if you could add some of the options which are on this car. But you can't. Mercedes, for some reason, don't let you choose some of the options that this car has on some of the lower model cars, which I think is a real shame. Anyway, uh, warranty-wise, what are you looking at? Well, it's a three-year unlimited mileage warranty with the car. So, about okay. I mean, it's nothing outstanding. I mean, you'd sort of now in the realms of people like Hyundai and, and some of the Chinese manufacturers offering up to eight-year warranties. The German ones now feel a little bit antiquated with a three-year warranty. 
but there you go. Uh, the battery warranty is, as you'd expect, it's sort of industry standard, eight year or 100,000 miles. So in terms of competition for the EQE, what else could you consider? Well, despite this price point being dominated by SUVs, electric saloons are coming back thick and fast. Of course, we've already tested the rather excellent Genesis electrified G80, which we think is a real rival for the EQE. Also, there's the car that started the whole ball rolling, which is coming back to the UK in its very revised form this year, which is the Tesla Model S. And I think that car's going to be a real thorn in Mercedes-Benz's side. BMW, its main German rival, of course, are going to show a new 5 Series this year. And they've already said to us that there's going to be an i5 within that range, so an all-electric version of the 5 Series that we can expect to see as well, which will be the same size and the same marketplace for this. Audi have shown countless concepts as well, so we can imagine that there's going to be an A6 e-tron along any second now. And the one that we're really looking forward to in terms of saloon cars is the new Polestar 5, which is based on their Precept concept car, which we've had a little look at um, in concept form. And if it comes out looking anything like that, which Polestar have said that it will, and given the focus of sustainability and design and engineering of the brand, I can see that giving this one a real run for its money. Of course, you might want to throw your net a little bit wider away from the saloon car market, in which case you can't ignore things like the Jaguar I-Pace, a real favourite of ours, which is at a similar price to this. And of course, it's not great to look at, but it's good to drive. There's the BMW iX, as well as Mercedes-Benz's EQE SUV, which is coming out, if you want to think about an SUV. But if you wanted to move away from sort of like space, luxury and waftiness and trade that for dynamics, then there's no getting away from the fact that for less money than this car, you could be driving a Porsche Taycan or an Audi e-tron GT. Hmm. So here's what we like and what we don't like about the new Mercedes-Benz EQE. We like what's well, comfort and refinement. It's space on offer. The interior design and of course the driver interface and user system. And it has a good range. We don't like. Well, the styling is just too bland and close to the EQS to be distinctive in our book. The lack of options available in the lower trim levels. We feel that the EV architecture should be better. The brakes take a little bit too much effort for this massive car. Rear headroom is tight for taller passengers and the price point to get one with a good specification. I've been toing and froing in this car since it arrived with me because at first I couldn't quite get the EQE, didn't quite see where the appeal might lie. And because it was part of me thought to myself, well, it's so similar to the EQS and at this price point as well, it just, I don't know, I don't know who it would really appeal to because what I did was when I looked at this car and I looked at the specification sheet, I looked in the classified section and I thought, well, for a couple of thousand pounds more, you could bend to like an EQS for, you know, that's done a few thousand miles. And that is a car we really do admire and is exceptional at what it does. And then I suppose up until BMW i7 arrives with me in a couple of weeks time, it's probably the best luxury EV that you can buy. And it doesn't quite have the dynamics that are there in terms of the Taycan or the e-tron, which is personally what I would buy for this level of money. And of course, it doesn't have that blistering performance that Tesla have been all, all going on for so long with the Model S. So I didn't quite see where the EQE fitted in. But then the other night, I went for a drive, just myself, and I put on some music, I got the temperature set just right, and I just thought, I'm not even gonna think about this, I'm just gonna go for a drive. And then it started to kind of just make a little bit more sense. If you're someone who is driven, in other words, you're chauffeured around, you'll want an EQS, there's no doubt about that. But if you're somebody that drives yourself and you spend your days flying up and down the motorways and you kind of want it to be effortless, you don't really want to have to think too much about it, then the EQE really starts to come into its own. Now, I think personally that the pick of the range might be lower down than this particular car, because in terms of the price point where the EQE starts and where something like a hybrid E-Class, where we get you something similar, there's not a massive amount of price difference. So if you are looking at maybe a hybrid E-Class, but you want to go electric, then the lower down models of this, 
there's not a massive gulf between them. It takes a little bit of time and it takes a little bit of searching for, but when you do, the EQE's appeal starts to come through. Thank you for watching another episode of Auto EV and another one of our road test reviews. As always, please make sure that you are subscribed to the channel. And once you've done that, press the little bell button down below so that you'll be notified of when our next video goes live. If you have enjoyed our road test review of the EQE, make sure you do give a thumbs up. And obviously, as always, please leave us your comments down below as well. Let me know your thoughts on the EQE and, of course, of the channel as a whole. Am I right? Is this in a car that would appeal to you? Or do you just think it's a little bit of a misnomer? And can't quite see the point of it. Let us know your thoughts. Now remember we're across all social media as well, so Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, even TikTok, believe it or not, we're on there now, so please also give us a follow there because every little bit helps. And if you're a bit bored now and you're wondering what to do that the episode's come to an end, have no fear because if you stick on the YouTube channel, well, there's plenty more videos for you just to waste your day away with. Not just road test reviews, but twin tests, electric icons, van reviews, and even motorbike reviews from my guest presenter, Charlie Berman. All that's left for me to say is thank you once again for watching us and supporting us. I hope to see you again soon.